Well, today we're continuing in our 12-part series called The X Factor. The X Factor. Everybody say The X Factor. And today is actually part number 10. And I'm going to do some real teaching today because I just believe that with all of our getting, we need to get some understanding. Part number 10 today is entitled Fully Trained. Everybody say Fully Trained. I do realize (laughs) after, my God, it's going to be 17 years of being a lead pastor that this is not the sexiest title that we could come up with but it's a better assignment and it's a better goal. And today I have a assignment to get us to where we embrace training. And so I have two goals, write this down if you're a note taker. Goal number one is to help the people of our church embrace training. We all need training whether you know this or not, okay? Many times we reject training, we run from training, um, we make excuses, we quit on training when it gets hard, but training is actually good for our soul. And we need to be trained in the things of God. Ah. Number two, here's my second goal. To help um, the people of our church embrace training others. Because we're being trained not just for our training, but the hope is that we can also help train others. Um, The inspiration for today's message is found in Luke chapter 6, verse number 40. If you have a Bible, please go there. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Are y'all ready? If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. Luke chapter 6, verse number 40, it says that, let's read it together. Ready, read. The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Okay. And so the first part says that the student is not above their what? Don't miss this. The student is not above their what? This shows me the importance of respecting and honoring those who feed you the word of God. It's very important because honor is the currency of the miraculous that you do not take those who have helped you, prayed for you, baptized you, ministered to you for granted. Too many people lack spiritual authority because they don't respect spiritual authority. I learned this years ago that to be in spiritual authority, you must learn to honor spiritual authority. The centurion soldier taught us that in the New Testament. Now, what do I mean by spiritual authority? You are supposed to heal the sick. We are supposed to cast out devils. But many people have just submitted to doctrine for they have no demonstration because to be in that authority, you have to be submitted to authority. And many times when you show up and try to cast out devils, they like, Pastor Ken I know, Pastor Josh I know, but who are you? Paul I know and Jesus I know, but you don't have authority because you don't know how to submit to spiritual authority. Now, this is a teaching that we really need today because rebellion is the norm in our culture today. Honor is actually abnormal, but we want to live abnormally. One of the major truths that we teach our children, me and Tabitha, we have three wonderful kids, we teach them to honor adults for being adults. We teach them to honor school teachers because they're their school teachers. We teach them to honor their coaches because they're their coaches. We teach them to honor law enforcement officers because they the doggone five-o. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Not because they're perfect, but because they're in an office of authority. And the Bible says that when we honor them for that office, God will honor us. And we're being taught to rebel towards authority, um, have dissension towards authority, and it actually is hurting us. We don't honor the people because the people aren't perfect. We honor them unto the Lord because the office is perfect. It It is an office of authority, all right? I guess what I'm saying is that Daniel's son had a respect for Mr. Miyagi. Come on, Karate Kid. Y'all remember the movie? I'm not talking about the new rendition of Karate Kid. I'm talking about the the first one. Anybody remember the first one? Y'all remember the story? Mr. Miyagi was trying to teach Daniel some some karate, and he had him painting his house, waxing his car. He had him doing all these things, painting the fence. One day, Daniel's son, he gets upset at Mr. Miyagi. He's like, man, you got me doing everything for you. You ain't teaching me no karate. Mr. Miyagi says, Daniel's son, <laughs> right? Come here. And he said, wax on. And he started doing like this. And Mr. Miyagi started punching at him. He was blocking the punches, meaning that Daniel's son was being trained and he didn't even know he was being trained. 
See, some of you all been coming to church and you thought you was coming for a word, you was coming for training, and you need to be trained whether you know it or not because there's punches of the enemy that are coming your way and we need you to be able to wax on and wax off. Come on, somebody. We need you to embrace training. For those of you all who are old school, some of y'all too young to remember the first Karate Kid, but there came a place where they went to a tournament and somebody was calling out Mr. Miyagi's name and they, and they didn't pronounce it right. And by this time, Daniel's son had grew up in this understanding of honor towards leadership. And he was like, no, that, that's Miyagi. Look, say it right, Miyagi, right? Because he understood this, that a student is never greater than the teacher. I'm telling you, this is a whole revelation that the student is never greater than the teacher. That doesn't mean that you won't have more money, more success, and more platform. It just means that you need to remember where you got your start. You know, I I just, I want to be that kind of person that always, you know, when I first got filled with the Holy Spirit back in 2001, I had a zeal for God. Like many of you all, you have a zeal for God, but you haven't grown in knowledge yet, and it's okay, just stick around. Sometimes when you get a zeal for God, you kind of want to diss where you came from, the churches that you came out of, the pastors that didn't teach you what you know now. I remember years ago, you know, I grew up in a very traditional church, so when I came to a church like this and I realized about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and I began to learn about tongues and the interpretation of tongue and the working of miracles and the gift of healing and I began to learn eschatology and end time events, there was a level of disdain that I had a little bit, like, not disdain, but like, almost like, what is the word when you um, feel a little resentment? Like, why didn't anybody else teach me this? I've been in church all these years, nobody else ever said this. And almost, if you're not careful, you can kind of get prideful and you can begin to diss the very people that gave you the foundation that made you who you are today. And so I've positioned myself now over the years that I will never dishonor another church. I will never dishonor another pastor. I will never dishonor anybody that prayed for me, baptized me, helped me, ministered to me, encouraged me, prayed for me on the altar. I just don't understand the people who come to a church and they get baptized here, they get filled with the Holy Spirit in that church, you get your marriage together in that church and you're in that church five years, then you leave that church and you start talking bad about that church. What's that? That's dishonor. And whenever you dishonor what God honors, you won't have God's best in your life. And so I've always positioned myself, and the good news is, Tabitha, is that we can go back to every church that we've ever been a part of. We haven't been a part of a lot of them, but like four or five of them over our lives. And we can go to every mentor and every pastor that we've ever had, and there's not one bridge that we've ever burned. Every single mentor, when I go back to them, they will be glad to see me coming, and I will be glad to see them. And they might not, watch this, they might not have the platform that I have now. They might not even have the money that I have now, the success that I have now. They might not have anything that I ever have, but the principle does not change that the student is never greater than the teacher because you would not be who you were, who you are without somebody laying down their life to get you to where you are. And God used all of those people. Oh, are y'all here with me today? And so Luke chapter six, verse 40, The second part says that the student is not above the teacher, but everybody who's fully trained will be like their what? Be like their what? Is it on the board? Luke chapter six, verse 40, y'all with me in the back? (laughs) Everybody who's fully trained will be, pull it up, Luke 640, is it a jam? It's okay, whatever. (laughs) What do I see in this scripture? I see the importance of a contemporary model, you know, like, I think that there are some that's like, well, you just, don't, you, you just want to be like Jesus. No, I want to follow people that are more like Jesus and follow them as they follow Christ. Oh. The student is never greater than the teacher, but the end goal for all training is that the student will be like their teacher. And so it is biblical and right that we have contemporary models. You know, like I love David in the Bible and I love Joseph. And I love Daniel. I love, I love these guys. I love David. I love, when I, read, I, when I read about David, I learn about having a heart after the heart of God. I learn what not to do, how he messed up with Bathsheba. I, I love David. I can't wait to meet him when we get to heaven. I love Joseph. I love how he was thrown into the pit. He was thrown into prison, but he still arose. He had an integrity that could not be shaken. I love him. I love Daniel. The Bible says that he had a spirit of excellence on him and he was preferred above other presidents. I love the fact that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and his response in the den looking at lions, that amazes me. 
And so I love all of these Old Testament and New Testament characters, but truthfully, I don't know them. I can't talk to them. I can't call them and I can't watch their life. But for me, listen, I love the Bible, but there's something about a contemporary model that has really done it for me. There's something about somebody that stands up on Sunday or a small group leader that I can call or somebody that I can come to for prayer or somebody that I can email and get some advice from. There's just something about a contemporary model that I think we need to begin to embrace. So Luke chapter 6 verse 40, it says that the student is not greater than the teacher, but the student will be like his teacher. What I'm suggesting is that it's okay for us to actually honor and embrace and actually look for contemporary models. Because the truth be told, we all need a model. We really do. In ministry, you need a model. Like, you know, like, like we're going to Relate Conference in the next month. I'm taking my staff. What are we doing? We're looking for a model. How do we have better groups? How do we have more healthy church? How do we have best, better worship? We need a model. One of the worst places you can be is where you don't have no model and you're trying to figure it out all for yourself. Yeah. You know, the Lord spoke to me about 15 years ago and he said, I want you to have a multi-ethnic, multi-racial you know, multicultural ministry. At the time as an African-American man, I did not see that, I didn't have a model. It took me 10 years of trial and error and pain and sweat and blood to, to, to produce what you guys get to enjoy every day. And some of y'all take this for granted. That's what it means when you don't have a model, God asks you to pioneer and then you become the model. And so because I did not have a model, I had 10 years of pain, but now we are the model. And so now people from around the world can look to our church and say, okay, that's how you create an atmosphere that looks like heaven. We all need a model. Come on, somebody. In a business, you a business person, you need a model for your business. Some of you all are struggling financially just because you don't have a model of somebody that you can sit down with and say, how do you do your budget? What do you invest in? Like a guy told me the other day that he invested $3,000 in cryptocurrency and made $15,000 in two weeks. I say, there's the model. I got to go, can, can I take you out for lunch? You want to go to Seasons 52? The treat is on me. I just need a model. Come on, somebody shout a model. See, some of y'all, you're married and you're struggling because you don't understand the contemporary model that's before you. See, we need a model. We need somebody. Our marriage is here, but I see somebody's marriage who is there. Please tell me, what are you doing? How are you loving her? How are you treating her? What do you say when you're off? What are you doing? Because we all need a model. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Is it there now? Luke 6, 40. It says, but everybody who is fully trained, that's where I want to go to next. Everybody say fully trained, fully trained. will be like their teacher or like their model. And so here's the goal this year. We want to see the people of our church fully trained. Come on, y'all. This is the year of multiplication. This is a season of discipleship. And so in two weeks, we're launching small groups. And you say, Pastor, why do you guys have all of these things? It's just another avenue for us to train you. It's just another training module. Small groups where you can find relationships with people. Growth track. It's just another way that we, we train. In February, you'll start to hear announcements about an interest meeting for the Alive Leadership Institute because some of you all have a call on your life and you know you have a call on your life. What do you do? You take a step of faith into some training. That's all this two-year process is. We are just helping to mold and train the gift of God that's on the inside of you, all right? Actually, this Thursday, February 1st, we're relaunching, we're launching our first ever Better Marriage Boot Camp online. Tabitha and our team and myself, we have been working on a marriage boot camp since July. We have put hours, weeks, and months into this moment. And so we're, taking, we're going to be married 25 years this year. We're taking all of our ups and downs and all arounds, and we're putting it into a 90-day journey where we can be your marriage mentors. We can be your marriage coaches. And, and, and this is what I know about marriage. Marriage takes an investment that you have to invest, not just one time, but consistently. And we want to help your marriages go from bad to good, good to great, and great to out of this world. But it will require an investment. But this is what I want you to know. Why do we have podcasts? It's just another training tool. It's just another, the, the Lord showed me this vision and it was, how many of you all have workout equipment at home that you don't use? Be, be truthful, come on, how, come, can you lift your hand? There's quite a few of you all, all right, in every service that you have workout, you have a treadmill that you never get on. You have a weight bench and it has clothes sitting on it. 
you have an old school Nordic track out in the shed somewhere that you don't think anything about it again, right? You have a Pelotonic and you don't ride nowhere. You, you have workout equipment that you don't use at all. But isn't that like many believers? That you have workout equipment and tools all around you and you're believing for a miracle this year, but not if you don't use the equipment and the tools that you already have. Small group is a tool. Growth track is a tool. ALI is a tool. Midweek is a tool. Sunday morning is a tool. Come on, somebody. All of those are just equipment. We cannot make you get on the treadmill. You have to be mature enough to say, this is going to be my best year ever. I got everything. We got head coaches, assistant coaches. We got, we got trainers all around us. But can you submit to the training? Because the training is for the reigning somebody. Everybody wants to reign, but have you been trained to be able to reign? Like, through our fast, I wasn't watching TV, and we were binge watching some Christian stuff. So I watched Chosen. Have y'all seen The Chosen? Now, if you haven't watched The Chosen, you got to do it now. It starts off slow, and I fell asleep 23 times as I, was, <laughs> as I was trying to get. But once you get it, and you get used to the characters, woo. one thing I noticed about the disciples when they were following Jesus, they were hungry for training. Teach me, Rabbi. I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you wherever I need to go. What happens to the disciples of Christ in today's church that we're not hungry for training? And the scripture says that everybody who's fully trained will be like their teacher, and the ultimate teacher is Jesus. <sighs> so what I'm suggesting to us today is that we need to embrace training, be grateful for training, and actually seek after training. We could easily, more easily say that um, we could call it coaching, because coaching is a word that's kind of more acceptable than training. Training sometimes takes too much humility for some of you all, and who do you think you are to want to train me? I don't think I'm anybody. Just go somewhere else. You know, I don't care. Um, but if I say, I want to be your marriage coach. Oh, yeah. I got a business coach. I got a fitness coach. I got an emotional coach. You know, co saying you got a coach is almost like wearing Gucci or Prada. It's like, it's, it's like one of those things that's like socially okay. But do you know why? Because when it comes to coaching, if I was asked you, how do you define coaching? Most of you all would define coaching based upon encouragement and inspiration. I just need someone to encourage me and to inspire me and to help me. I just need a coach. But you don't understand that real coaches, there is a training aspect to a real coach. Matter of fact, anybody had a real coach back in the day? You ain't even like that dude, but you knew how to win a championship. I don't like you, I can't stand you, but you bring the best out of me. Some of y'all come in here and you want candy after candy after, you want me just to encourage you, don't correct me, just encourage me, just inspire me. Oh, that seemed, it was too heavy today. That was too much of condemnation. No, forget all that. You need to be trained. You are a soldier in the army of God. We need you raising the dead in this generation. Come on, we need you opening up blinded eyes. I've been watching The Chosen, and I've been like, why ain't that happening more? We got to be trained. Got to be trained, church. So I'm not here just to be your coach. Or well, you can use that title if you want to. I am here to coach, but I'm going to coach you hard. I'm going to coach you hard, because those are the best coaches. Those are the best coaches. So anyway, um, I don't want to feel good. I want to be good. 2024, here's the goal. Y'all ready for it? Yeah. To have a fully trained church. Yeah. Not a partially trained church. Man, I am milking Luke chapter 6, verse 40. My God. <laughs> not, a, not a part. Come on, somebody. So, too many believers are partially trained. You know enough Bible to say you love Jesus, but not enough to get victory in your life. There's too many partially trained believers. You know a scripture, but don't see the manifestation of its glory. You are partially trained when you should be fully trained. There's too many people sitting in our churches, message after message after message, but when your feet hit the street, the devil do not get nervous because you're partially trained. And then there's some of us that, listen, we are, we're not trained at all. We're not, we need to be trained, y'all. We're not trained at all. Like you said yes to Jesus, but that's it. Your tongue is not trained. Your mind is not trained. Your sexuality is not trained. Your money is not trained. Your time management is not trained. And we need to embrace, I'm preaching better than every service. You better give God some praise right now. We need to embrace training. For the training is for the reigning. 
Now, 1 Timothy chapter 4, that's all I could get out of Luke 640, so. <laughs> 1 Timothy 4 and 8. Y'all ready for this? Let's read this together. Ready, read. It says that physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. You know, I've seen more Jenny Craig Planet Fitness commercials over the last 30 days than I have all year long. Have y'all noticed that here in January? Why is that? Because the fitness experts know that at the beginning of the year, people want to get in shape. How many of you all have a goal this year to lose some weight and to get your health in order? Okay, I know I do, all right? So for me, now that's part of our culture code, we want to stay fit, but for me, I want to try to get all of my, my, my stuff in order, cholesterol and glucose. I want to get my body, I, I, I want to get swole like Pastor Josh. I don't need Pastor Josh looking like He-Man up here and I come up here looking like a stick man. We don't, we don't need that, all right? And so I'm committed to getting in shape, all right? Um, but what this scripture is saying is that you getting in spiritual shape is more important than you getting in physical shape. Please bring it back up for a moment, First Timothy. Please bring that back up. All right, it says that physical training is good. Now, for those of you all who say, well, I'm spiritual, I don't need to work out. No, physical training is good, all right? But training for godliness is better. No, we don't say that. It says that it's much better. So it basically is speaking about priorities. Somebody shout priorities. Let me see where it's the camera, all right? So I know that there are some of you all this year that you're like, this is my year. I'm going to the gym. I know that some of you all this year, I see you on Instagram and TikTok, you are gonna try to get from a six pack to a nine pack. I know that for some of you all this year, it is all about your beach body workout. It's all about you having the right amount of protein. I'm, I know, I, listen, I know that this is your time where you're like, I'm gonna get it tight and I'm gonna get it right. This is my year, the beach is coming up in June, I gotta get it right. And I would say to you that those things are good. I encourage you to get it tight, get that nine pack. But I'm here to also tell you that having training for godliness is better than having training for your nine pack. So there are some people that you got a nine pack, you got it tight and you got it right, but you don't hear the still small voice of God. Ah, your priorities are just out of order. You're not a bad person, you're just a blind person. You're not bad, you're just blind to spiritual things and we need to help you. Come on, I'm looking at the camera. I wanna help you this year, not just to have everything on the outside looking good, but everything on the inside being good. Because the things that you see are temporal and subject to change. The things that you cannot see are eternal eternal and will have an eternal impact. So we thank God for your new gym membership and all of your goals and plans and we with you because I'm going to get this house in order. But more importantly, can you pray? Can you prophesy? Can you make disciples? Do you know where Genesis is in the Bible? Can you live a holy life? Can you be healed of your mental illnesses? Come on, somebody. Somebody shout, this is my year. And we have to embrace training. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Say amen if you're there. Can we read this one together? 2 Timothy 3, 16, ready, read. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, uh, and training in righteousness. What I notice about 2 Timothy 3 is that the Bible is not just a book of encouragement and inspiration. And that's part of it. You know, I never want to have the church where you come to and you feel like you got beat up. Nobody wants to come to the beat up, the beat up church no more. You know, nobody wants to come to the church where we're just telling you you're going to hell. Okay. And so we want to inspire you. We want to encourage you. But when I read the Bible, don't miss this balance that when it comes to the good word of God, there are four key elements that's given from the word of God. The word of God is good for Teaching, everybody shout teaching. teaching. Rebuking, everybody shout rebuking. rebuking. Correcting, everybody say correcting. correcting. And training, everybody shout training. training. If we were honest up in this church today, and we said, how many of you all came to get rebuked today? How many of you all came to get corrected today? And how many of you all walked in church asking God to be trained today? Our numbers would be very low. 
which lets us see the problem between how God's told us to live, but how we currently live. Most of us have come just to check something off of a box and to be encouraged and to be inspired, but the good word of God comes to do more than inspiration and encourage you. It comes to correct us, rebuke us, and also train us. But those aren't things that we should reject. Those are actually the things that we need to embrace and accept because it's what makes us more like Jesus. We have to embrace training. It's part of discipleship, people of God. Ephesians chapter four, Verse 11, let's read this together. Are y'all ready? Come on, all services, ready, read. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be what? Built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and we become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is what we commonly refer to as the fivefold ministry gifts. And Jesus was all five of these. Jesus was apostle. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was evangelist. Jesus was a pastor. Jesus was a teacher. So now, Ephesians chapter four, the pretext says, that he who descended to the lower parts of the earth is the same one who ascended and he gave gifts to men. So when Jesus ascended up on high, now he's given us and calling us to specific offices. Not every single person is called to these offices, but these are offices. This is what I call the New Testament governing arm of God. And so now he calls men and women to be in these offices, apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor. It's what we call the fivefold ministry gifts. And so when a person says yes, and they are trained and ordained and established in one of these offices, they operate under a mantle and an anointing as if Jesus was in the earth himself. So if you come to me and you say, hey, Ken, how's it going? You won't receive anything divine. We can play basketball and go bowling. But when you say, Pastor Ken, you summons the anointing of that office who is Jesus himself as an under shepherd to minister to your spiritual needs. That's why it's so very important that we understand these fivefold ministry gifts, all right? Now, but what I want you to know is why would Jesus give us fivefold ministry gifts? The answer is found in verse 12. Pull that back up if you don't mind. And it's found in the first word here, to equip his people for what? Works of service. So my job as a ministry gift and I'm actually more apostolic than I am pastoral as a church planter, is to equip his people for works of service. So my job, and I wanna do a good job, hopefully y'all think I'm doing okay, but my job is just not to make you feel good about you, my job is actually to equip you. Now if you don't know that, we can always bump heads because I'm challenging by nature and I try to put funny in it so, you know, you can handle me. But my job is to equip you for works of service. Now, if you're here and you're thinking that you just come to church just to take and take and take and take and take, you don't understand what Christianity is really about. My job is to serve you by equipping you to do the work of the Lord. I know that some of you all work 60, 70 hours somewhere else, but there need to be a portion of your life where you work for Jesus. Meaning that he's given you gifts, talents, anointings, and callings, and we use them so that the body of Christ may be built up. So our desire here is never for us to have a service that has any empty seats. You say, Pastor, it's just about the numbers here. The devil is a liar. It's not just about the numbers, but the Bible says that Jesus wished not one be lost. And as long as there's one lost person, we're gonna keep building up the church because that's what I have to give an account for. I need you to hear my heart on this. I have to stand before Jesus and give an account of how I did as a ministry gift, equipping you to build up his house. Now, some of you all have come from churches where there's one pastor or a group of elders and they do all of the work while you just come and sit. And we've created this lazy mantra that has never been the will of God. It's not supposed to be one pastor going to all the hospitals and doing all the funerals and going all the weddings. People say, well, pastor, I don't have your number. Well, you don't need my number. You need each other's numbers and the body will build up itself. Quit putting your focus on me. I'm just doing my part to equip you so that people can have your number so people can, you can pray for people, you can lead a small group, you can do what God's called you to do. And I was looking for commentary 
for Ephesians chapter 4. And you know, when you Google and say, what does it really mean? I, I found this, and I'm going to read it to you out of BibleReference.com, BibleRef.com. Read this. It says, the overall mission for every Christian leader is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Somebody shout amen. amen. This involves the idea of training believers to serve God on the earth. Notice that this training is not focused purely on academics, but a strong emphasis on practice. Leaders are to train others in the church to serve others. In addition, ministry is work. Somebody shout work. work. It involves expending energy and placing the needs of others first. Ministry is difficult to do from a distance because personal involvement is required in order to have the greatest impact. You can't do this at home, y'all. The reason church leaders are to train every believer to serve others is for the building up of the body of Christ. Jesus wants his church built bigger. In many modern churches, one pastor is expected to provide all or most of the ministry work for those in the congregation. When this takes place, others do not use their spiritual gifts. When the people do not serve, the congregation's growth stagnates. Instead of allowing this to happen, church leaders are called, I'm called, somebody shout, pastor is called, to focus on training others to serve. In this way, every believer is growing in maturity and making disciples. And that's what this whole year is about, of others. So in closing, I have five key points that I would like you to go away with today. Are y'all good today? Yes. Yeah. Keys to becoming fully trained. Five keys to becoming fully trained. My hope is that you'll grab hold of these as if you're gonna go share them with someone else. If you're ready, shout them ready. ready. Number one, you have to identify the trainer or trainers. You gotta identify those that you will allow to train you. You have to identify those that you will allow to speak into your life. Now, I cannot tell you what to do. You're grown people but I will tell you what I've done. So for me, before I was a pastor 20 years ago, my senior pastor, my lead pastor, was the number one voice that I allowed to train me to speak into my life. I had a team now, I had other people, and uh, I would go to them, but I looked at them as an extension of the lead pastor. His campus pastors, his assistant pastors, his elders, was an extension of the grace on his life. I can't tell you what to do. This is just how I viewed it over the years and it's kept me safe, okay? Um, I had a team that helped train me. There was an assistant pastor, his name was Dwayne. I could go to him if I had questions. There was another, uh, another elder, his name was Elder Barry. He would help me out if I had questions. I would be in Elder Barry's office asking him about this or that or the other. And then I had a marriage mentor, and that's all I had. I basically had a dream team of four people because you don't need everybody trying to train you because everybody has different styles of training. Everybody has, you know, some people want to, you know, have you jog and do too much cardio. Some people just want to be in, in the weight room. You need to know who you're supposed to be receiving from. And so this was always a safe place for me that I built a team around me, and I still have a team today. I have overseers. I have a pastor today. I look for people to train me. Actually, next week, Vision Sunday, the CEO from Overflow is going to be here. He's a brilliant young man from Silicon Valley and is doing some great things in the kingdom of God. And um, we're partnering with them. I've asked him to train me of how we build the kingdom builder ministry here, how we actually support the business owners of our church that feel a call to build wealth and share that wealth. I'm always looking for training. What about you? Number two, five keys to becoming fully trained. Number two is that you have to submit to training. Everybody shout, submit to training. Submit to training. And this is what I need you to hear about submission, is that submission is not a position of weakness. It actually takes maturity for you to submit. Honestly, nobody can tell you what to do. If you never want to come back to this church again, you never have to. We cannot make you be trained. Wives, your husband cannot make you be submitted to him. Same, vice versa. Husbands, you cannot make, vice versa, okay? What is that? When a person submits, it's out of the act of their own maturity. It takes two equals to submit. Many people, when you hear the word submission, you hear slavery. You ain't nobody's slave. Nobody can control you and make you do what you want to do, what you don't want to do. So if you ever submit, it's an act of your own will based upon your submission to the Lordship of Jesus but you have to submit to training, you know? 
I can feel it as a preacher. Sometimes I'm trying to train and encourage them, and some people are like, no, I don't know about this, and I don't know about that. Well, go ahead somewhere. I can't help someone that's not submitted to training. Do your thing. Number three, you got to stick with the training even when it's hard. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Some of you all, you quit too easy, and you quit when it gets hard. Okay? Years ago, I had a personal trainer that would come to my house. He was a physical trainer. He would work me out. Had me doing all these exercises, man, all these burpees, all these squats, all these get-ups, and I would, and I would act like I'm so tired because I didn't want to do no more. And, be, <laughs> and you know what he had the audacity to say? Give me three more. <laughs> Don't you see how I'm breathing? I'm about to have a heart attack. Ten more seconds. What was his job? His job was to create a new norm for me. His job was to move me out of my comfort zone beyond my own self-imposed limits. Some of you all say, I can't. No, you got three more in you. Yes, you can. Yes, you can do 21 days of prayer and fasting. The devil is a liar. So you need somebody in your life that will push you beyond your own self-imposed limits. And I'm here to get the juice out of every single person that's a part of a live church. But you got to stick with the training even when it's hard. But the number four one, then to get somebody set free, are y'all ready? Shout, I'm ready. ready. Number four is you got to get rid of the pride. I'm anointed this year to come after that spirit. I'm anointed this year, I am. We're going to do a whole series called Humble Pie because I found out that we live in a very prideful generation where everybody thinks they know everything, but many of us don't know God. And I'm not that smart, but I'm smart enough to know that I don't know it all and I need somebody else's help, you know? Some of your marriages would be so much better if you just submitted yourself and humbled yourself to somebody who has a great marriage. But you're too prideful to come in for counseling. You're too prideful to tell people about the mess going on in your home. Some of you all would be set free from the demonic if you just told somebody, listen, I still go watch pornography here and there, but because you want to do it in the dark, that spirit of pride has you gripped. And if you could just humble yourself. I realize there are people that you've been saved for the last 30 years and you've been a part of this church and that camp and this church and that camp and now it's hard for you to submit because of my age and my background and you think you know, but this is what I look for in training. I look for fruitfulness and faithfulness. It is not about their age. It is not about the color of their skin. It is not about their education. It is about fruitfulness and faithfulness. If you start looking for people that ain't just talking something but have fruit, like years of fruit, you will know a tree by its some of you all are online and you listen to people that have no and then I'm looking for faithfulness because anybody can talk this talk for 10 months I want to know can you still live right for 10 years I want to know can you still be married to the same person in 20 years I don't care what you say today I want to know can you be fruitful and can you be faithful and we need humility people of God we need humble pie because if you keep lifting up yourself God's going to bring you low but if you can lower yourself, God's going to lift you up. And number five, for those of you all who want to be fully trained, is you got to turn around and you got to train others. And so we talked about being a spiritual mom and a spiritual dad. You first got to be a good son and a daughter before you can be a good spiritual mom or dad. You first got to be trained before you can train others. You first got to be a disciple before you can go out and make disciples. How many of you all this year, you want to be more like Jesus? Everybody here wants to be more like Jesus. Here's the news flash. You ready? You cannot be like Jesus if you don't make disciples. It's true. We want to be like Jesus. But if you do everything the Bible says and do not make disciples, you cannot be like Jesus. I've been watching The Chosen. <laughs> he made disciples. And for those of you who are like, I want to be like Jesus this year, we want you to be like Jesus. He is the goal, not me. He is the goal. He is the bar. He is the one that we admire to be. He is the one we, 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 we aspire to be like, right? He was a disciple maker. You say, Pastor, I don't know how to do it. You learn to make disciples by going out and making disciples. So you come to a live church. We should change the name from a live church to a live training center. You come to church for the training that's for the reigning and you use your notes and your revelation to go out and train somebody else, and the gathering is for the scattering, and we come out, we release bitterness, and we get better, and we go out to change the world and make disciples of all people. Woo! We're living in a significant moment. 
Come on, somebody. We're living in the, in the time that the people on the chosen prayed that they could live in the time that we're living in. Come on, y'all. There are people that's been waiting for this moment. We are going to usher in an end time harvest of souls. God wants to use you to preach the gospel, not just me, but you're going to preach it in the boardroom, in the classroom. You're going to preach it wherever you go, for you are an ambassador of Christ. My question today is will you receive this assignment? How many of you all say I receive it? All right. Well, we need the training for the training is for the reigning. Every head bowed, every eye closed in the building. I want to pray for those of you all, all of our services, all of our campuses. There's no distance in the spirit. The Lord is in this place. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You don't have to be a perfect person to be a forgiven person, but you do need to put your faith in Jesus. Training is nothing but training unless you have Jesus at the center. It's natural training, and it might get you some good, but it doesn't have an eternal impact unless Jesus is ultimately in charge of all of the training. If you're here today, all of our campuses, every service, let's make this moment between you and God. If you can admit that you've ever sinned, if you've ever fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, so we all need a savior. It's only pride that would say, no, I'm okay, I'm good by myself, and we are not. Because of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, there is a gap. Thankfully, Jesus stepped in to bridge that gap. And you don't have to be perfect to be forgiven, but you do have to surrender. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, I want this to be my best year ever, it will be if it's your best year spiritually. And it starts with you giving your heart to Jesus today. And so on the count of three, if you say, Pastor, pray for me, I want to be saved. I want a relationship with Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to boldly lift up your hand and wave at me so that I can know who's making that decision today. This will be the most powerful, most important prayer that you've ever prayed. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I surrender my life to Jesus. Please lift up your hand in one, two, three. All over the building. Just lift it up now. Just wave at me for a moment. I see your hand. 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 God sees your hand. God sees your hand. Every service online, God sees your hand. You can put your hands down. Nobody prays alone. Let's pray this together. Say this, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I'm yours, you're mine. Jesus, I believe you died on a cross so that I could live. I accept you. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Today, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in a live church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right. If you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.